Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Today we have Dr. Carly Schneider. She's a psychiatrist in New York City. She's a member of the Female Physician Entrepreneurs Group, and I wanted to have her come on. Nadia, Dr. Nadia Sabri had started this Female Physician Spotlight a few months back. So we're ending that series up, and Dr. Carly Schneider is our last female physician entrepreneur spotlight. So thank you for you know being our spotlight today. I know that you're a psychiatrist in New York City. So you know, tell me how'd you get into this? Thank well, you for having me on. I'm I'm so honored to be the last. It's a, it's a great spot. I get the anger. Um, I didn't realize that. So I am a reproductive and perinatal psychiatrist, and I got into this very small, you know, really niche field um, in part because I fell, really kind of fell into psychiatry. I had not planned to go into psychiatry at all. In medical school, I had planned, I really enjoyed plastics, in fact. Um, I met and married a neurosurgeon in the midst of, uh, medical school, he was a resident. And then I was pregnant and graduated and, you know, I had this like, one of those aha moments where I was like, oh my gosh, I, I want to be home for breakfast. You know, and I had, and we, he was doing his fellowship. We were going up to Toronto for a year anyway. So I, I had a year to kind of think about what I wanted to do. And I completely freaked out. I was like, I'm not going to be home enough. You know, I, I had one of those moments. Um, and for a multitude of reasons, I really didn't want to go into a medicine subspecialty. My dad is a psychiatrist. And I was like, okay, fine. I'll go into psychiatry. It was like, sure. I started my residency and I was miserable. Like I, I was, it was not what I wanted to be doing. And, you know, every time there was a code on the cycle, I was like, I was there. I was like, oh, I'll do that. You know, and when I did my, my uh, four, six months on medicine floors or whatever, they realized very quickly I was the one, that was the only psych resident who could put in you know, a central line and I, I could do all this stuff from when I was doing plastics. And so all of a sudden I was like, oh, maybe I should do this. This is, you know, maybe I should switch specialties. Um, but then I was on the peds floor and there was this little baby who was admitted um, for neuro, for EEG monitoring. He had been, in, um, since the day he was born, he was seizing all the time. Beautiful baby. Like, your know, parents were like gorgeous family, you know, like just like little Hallmark card, perfect, right? And I had a baby at home. My baby was just about one little boy. And I identified with mom completely, right? But my baby was okay. And, you know, she had had a perfect pregnancy, at least they thought so. She probably had some infection they didn't know about. And no one was asking her how she was doing. And she would just sit there. And so I sat down and I talked to her. Eventually, and I, I to this day, don't know what the impetus was. I connected her with a grief counselor before he was discharged. And I saw the neurologist several months later who said that he, they had set up a program at that point where every mom whose baby or child was going to die, was going to be connected to a grief counselor because it had been so effective and successful for this mom that that was their ongoing plan. And so he thanked me. And the fact that I could make this change for this mom was really powerful to me. Um, and that was the first moment I was like, oh, okay. You know, like th that was really a tangible thing for me that I helped this one woman. Subsequently, one of my uh, senior residents, his wife was a reproductive psychiatrist. I had no idea what that was, but she was at Cornell. I went and talked to her. I set up a, an elective there. It took like two years to set up, but I went and I was like, oh, this is my calling. I found my people. Um, it really melded both medicine in terms of a lot. We do a lot with, you know, we have to rule out a lot, thyroid dysfunction and you know, there are a lot of reasons why a woman could feel the way she's feeling could be attributable to things beyond purely emotional issues. And it was something where I could, I, you know, work with my patients, understanding where they were coming from as a mother, as a woman. It was also, it's really on the cusp of everything new and exciting in psychiatry. And I was excited by it and I love it to this day. So I joke that I, I went to Cornell for that elective and I never left. 
um, because I'm still in attending there, uh, voluntary attending. I am still, I love what I do. I, I, you know, my patients are amazing. They're wonderful women and they get better. We really, you know, what we do, um, I see a lot of women in, who have infertility struggles or struggling with fertility issues and then, you know, they get pregnant and they stay with me. And I have women who come to see me who are planning a pregnancy or are pregnant or are postpartum and, you know, they, they do well and they do beautifully. And it's such a unique part of psychiatry because I think a lot of my field in psychiatry, people don't always do as well. You know, there's a lot of chronic illness, but in what I do, people, people do beautifully. It's so nice to see. I can tell you're very passionate about what you do. Your face really like just lit up. Yeah, I really like what I do. Um, I think it's it's really rewarding. Looking back on as far as being a resident, if you're unhappy with your path, what do you recommend? Because we do see that in the group sometimes, and you know some physicians who are in in a residency track and they're not happy. Well, I think the first thing to wonder is why, right? I mean, residency. I wasn't happy in my residency either. I, I to this day, I'm very close with my co-residents. We worked really hard. So, I, you know, I think the first thing is to identify what you're unhappy, right? If you're unhappy working really hard, well, that's probably going to lighten up. Are you unhappy with what you're doing? That's a different issue. Are you unhappy with the fact that you're inpatient a lot? Well, that's probably very something you could change, right? Like, depending on what you're doing. But I mean, in most specialties, you don't have to be inpatient when you're out of residency, right? I mean, you kind of have to figure out, is it what you're doing, who you're doing it with? Or do you fundamentally not like the field you chose? In which case, it's the rest of your life. You know, everyone talks about grinning and bearing it, but why? Life is, life is both short and long all at once. And, and I think there's so much to be said for really giving yourself the opportunity to be happy and not just sitting in a state of uh, discomfort just to say that you did, right? Like no one gets a medal at the end of the day because you gritted out something that was really awful to then say, now I'm miserable for the duration. Like, right? It's still your life. I'm a strong believer in making changes and earlier than, than later. Once, you know, not overnight, but no. once you've thought about it, absolutely. So I usually ask when you're looking back, would you have done anything different? You know, I, I was thinking about that. I, I think that um, making mistakes is really important. So I've definitely made mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes, but every mistake I've made has led me to something else and has been really informative. So I, I can't think of any mistake that I made that was such a catastrophic mistake that I would not make it again in hindsight. So I, my, my third child, my baby, um, was a preemie and was quite sick for the first six months of her life. Um, and I, my dad actually said to me, why don't you leave the, your private practice where I was working basically alone and come and work with me. And very impulsively, I said, okay. And I told the, you know, the woman who I was leasing an office with, I'm done. And within like two weeks, I was out of that office. And I had this moment of like, oh my God, I've never done anything impulsive in my life, let alone professionally. Um, and I freaked out, you know, was this the right move, et cetera. It was the best move ever. I, I, love working with my dad. But, you know, if you had asked me then, I would have said it was a huge mistake, right? I was giving up this autonomy that I had. This is my dad. I'm going to work with my father. You know, there were times in my old office with patients I knew very well, I would show up in running clothes. Now I could never do that. Which is true. I never do that anymore, <laughs> you know, which is probably a good thing from a professional standpoint. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of cringeworthy now when I think that I did that. It was not a good move. But, you know, at the time, I think I would have questioned whether it was a mistake. Um, but it really wasn't. And if nothing else, from a personal standpoint, it has been a gift 
in every way. I'm, I'm so blessed that I work with my father and I see him so often and, you know, I wouldn't change it for anything, you know, and I, I really think it, there are things that we see in the moment may be, you know, questionable, turn out to be the greatest thing. So it's how you look at it. That's really nice out, outlook on things. And it's wonderful that you're able to work with your dad. I love it. It's Very it's few people are able to do that. So going forward, what do you see? What do you, do you have any plans? I do. Um, in terms of my practice, I, you know, I'm say the course, I think my, my practice is actually grows every year. Um, I'm very lucky in that way. You know, I'm at a point in my practice where I can, I was saying to someone today, actually, you know, I, I never have to seek out patients and I can very comfortably, uh, you know, I, I saw a patient last week who came to me very much wanting to see me, but she's in very appropriate hands. You know, she doesn't need to see me. She seeing someone who takes her insurance, who was doing a perfectly good job. So I said, no, no, no. Like, and if she saw me financially, it really would have been a stretch for her. And there, you know, I'm kind of at a point where I was like, look, I put confidence in that person. Like, you're fine, right? Like, and that's a good feeling from uh, both ethically and morally, but also from a professional standpoint, like I don't need to run after patients. I don't have to market to get patients. You know, I've, I've built enough professional relationships. And, and also more importantly, I have, my patients will go to dinner parties now on a Friday. And then my secretaries will call me and be like, there must've been a dinner party because you got like six new referrals, you know, because one person will like go and tell all of her girlfriends. Um, and, you know, I have sisters who, all the sisters, you know, four sisters will come and, you know, which is nice. They all come together and it's like back to back appointments. Um, so from a professional standpoint, I don't have any specific plans because everything is kind of going the course and every year, both financially and, and otherwise, everything just grows in a natural way. I've been working on a uh, women's a nutritional bar for women. Um, and so we're hoping to launch in the next six to eight months. What will that include? It is a bar for women, by women, completely formulated for our bodies. And it is low sugar, but really tasty. It is completely healthful. It's vegan. It is paleo. It's all of the things that you want in a bar. And it is formulated thinking about our menstrual cycles and how we can eat to optimize our health and to really own our bodies and own our moods based on where we are in our cycle. So that's, you know, more to come, but it's, it's a really exciting endeavor. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know you were doing that. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's been a long time coming. You know, it's one of those things where you need to fall and jump back up multiple times and realize what you really, where you need to go on a path. And the cool thing about that is I knew nothing about that side, nothing about, you know, food industry, business, any of that. And I've had to learn and that's, it's a fun project. It's definitely <laughs> humbling at the same time. It's good though. You know, you have your practice and now you're able to do other things as well and incorporate it into your practice. Because... Yeah. And most importantly is I, you know, I'm a mom and I have three kids and they are, you know, they're more important than anything else. So they take, they take the most time, but they're also the most important. I do have to ask you, you have a busy practice for the people that are starting off. They're like, how do I get, pra how do I get patients? I don't know what to do. Do you have yeah. any suggestions for them? Yeah, sure. So the first thing is to realize that I think I speak for myself, but I'm sure I can speak for others when I say my first two years, I spent a lot of time playing solitaire in my office, right? Like there were, and that's okay, right? You can't expect to walk into a practice that's full. I have patients to this day, I still see one patient every week for $25 who I have from residency. She's my favorite patient. I adore her, adore her. Um, and the reason at the time, I mean, A, I, she's, I love her as a person, she's wonderful. But B was I wanted to have bodies in my office. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to have someone there and feel like I could connect. I went to lunches. You know, I, from a social standpoint, personally, I knew other doctors. So I went out with people and through that, 
you know, I connected with fertility doctors were a huge thing for me from medical school. Um, and that is a huge part of my practice anyway. So a huge interest of mine, but I work very closely with, you know, two, but very, very closely with one fertility group in the city. And I foster that relationship really closely. And that helped me. And I work with a bunch of OBGYNs and that helped me. But in the early, early days of my practice, I just, it's like you connect with who you know and you have to get out there. If you sit in your office, nothing's going to happen, right? It doesn't magically appear, but you know, you talk to colleagues and your patients, it's word of mouth. It's people are going to talk and but you have to go out to those networking dinners that are a little uncomfortable and you have to have your card and you hand it out and eventually you're going to get a phone call and someone's going to, you know, want to see you. And you, you know, you have to just get to that point where you're a little uncomfortable, but you just say, hi, my name is, and you say that over and over and over to a lot of people. And it takes sometimes, you know, spending money, on the different, you know, I never did Facebook ads or any of that stuff. I didn't have to in part because I live in New York City and I think it, I have the option of networking in a different mm -hmm. way. But if you don't live in a big city, you know, you have to get your name out there. So whatever way you're gonna do it, people don't just organically walk through your door. Um, but even with all the networking, it takes, time you can't expect to just build the practice i think the only alternative is if you take insurance and you're on a bunch of insurance panels i imagine that's the other way because people just search that way i i didn't do that um but that is definitely another way to build your practice you have to choose which way you want to go that's just it being clear with your messaging too right knowing what your goals are having set goals and being very oh, yeah. clear with your message yeah and you have to also remember if you start to go too broad with what your focus is, you can't go back. So you know, for me, I see women. That's my interest, right? I have one male patient who's wonderful. He's, he's great, but that's it, right? I, and my focus was always women's mental health. And I didn't sway or stagger from that because that's, what, that's referrals I wanted. Um, I didn't want to get kind of, I didn't want to be jumbled up with all the psychiatrists that people were referring to. I really wanted people to refer to me because they had women who fit into the mold of, because there aren't that many doctors like me. Um, I wanted to stand out. I didn't want to blend in. And it worked, but I think you have to really figure out who you are, what makes you, you, and why someone should refer to you instead of referring to someone else, and then tell them and tell them again. And tell them, you know, a third time, so that they remember you. And then when they're about to refer a patient, they remember you and your card and they hand your card. This is wonderful advice. Thank you so much again for coming on and being Thank able you. to do this podcast and YouTube video and you know to be a part of our group. Thank you. This was a great opportunity.